Welcome to Fall 2020 More Than the Score virtual talk series. We are thrilled to have so many of you join us today. We have more than 350 More Than the Score fans registered for this talk on women in politics, past, present, and future. Hi, I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. We are fortunate to have three stellar female faculty to share with us today. I will share just a little bit about each faculty, but please know their full bios are on the Lifetime Learning website. Melanie Barnes. Melanie is the professor of practice, the Dorothy Danforth Compton Professor and co-director of the Democracy Initiative at the Miller Center. She is co-director for policy and public affairs for the Democracy Initiative, led by the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Melanie is also a distinguished fellow at the UVA School of Law. During the, during the Obama administration, Melanie served as assistant to the president and director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. She spent more than 25 years crafting public policy on a wide range of domestic issues. Jennifer Lawless. Jennifer is the Commonwealth Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia. She has taught at Brown University and American University where she served as the Woman and in Politics Institute Director. Jennifer's research focuses on political ambition, campaigns and elections, and the media and politics. She is the author or co-author of six books, including Women on the Run, Gender, Media, and Political Campaigns in a Polarized Era. And she co-authored, It Still Takes a Candidate, Why Women Don't Run for Office. Barbara Perry. Barbara is the Cheryl L. Bilal's Professor and Director of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, where she co-directs the Presidential Oral History Program. She has authored or, or edited 14 books on presidents, first ladies, the Kennedy family, the Supreme Court, and civil rights and civil liberties. Barbara's conducted more than 100 interviews for the Presidential Oral History Project on George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. She also directs the Edward Kennedy Oral History Project. Barbara served as a US Supreme Court fellow and has worked for both Republican and Democratic members of the Senate. Our moderator for this conversation is Craig Bolton. Craig is professor of the public policy and politics and director of the Center for Effective Lawmaking at the Frank Batten School of Leadership in public policy here at UVA. Craig is also uh, has an appointment in the Woodrow Wilson Department of Politics. He is co-author of the book, Legislative Effectiveness in the United States Congress, The Lawmakers. Audience, we received many of your questions, uh, which the panel, panel will attempt to address. If you have a question during the presentation, please share it in the chat box below on your screen. The panel will try to answer as many of your questions as time permits. Now, please help me welcome this esteemed panel to share with us today. Craig, the microphone's all yours. Please begin the conversation. Thanks, Althea. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us here today. Our expert panelists are in high demand given everything that's uh, going on in the news, so I'm delighted they were able to take time to be with us here today. The topic of our discussion is women in politics, past, present, and future. So I want to start out with a question bringing us from the past to the present. 2020 is the 100 year anniversary of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. How well did that amendment live up to expectations from 100 years ago? And how does the vote of women influence politics today, perhaps in terms of a gender gap on the issues and candidates that women support? I'll just toss that open to the whole group. And welcome again. I, I can start. <laughs> um, I think just in terms of raw numbers, the 
granting women suffrage has actually mattered a lot for campaigns and elections. First of all, women are more likely than men to turn out to vote. Second, women are a greater proportion of the population than men. So when you think about any election, whether it be at the congressional or presidential level, women comprise more than 50% of the electorate, which means that if they voted as a complete monolithic group, and they don't, uh, they would decide every election. They're all, it's also really important because there is a gender gap. In every presidential election since 1980, and in all congressional elections since 1986, women have been more likely than men to support the Democratic candidate. Now, that doesn't mean that a majority of women always vote for the Democrat. In 1984, a majority of women supported Reagan. They just supported Mondale at higher rates than men. And so what this means is that when you think about political strategies of campaigns and candidates, the Democrats always want to do everything that they can to grow that gender gap, and the Republicans want to do everything they can to mitigate it. So one of the most important things that we've seen this election cycle is this fight over suburban female voters, especially independent women living in these battleground states who are ultimately decisive. And the reason strategically it makes so much sense to appeal to women is not only because of their policy preferences, but also because of their greater propensity to turn out to vote. I'll, I'll jump in, Craig. Um, just first of all, now everyone sees why um, Jennifer is uh, viewed as the number one expert on women <laughs> and politics. And um, while that is not one of my areas, uh, although a, a bit in civil liberties and civil rights, um, I will say that one of the examples that she gave, she said starting in 1980, there had been gender gaps. And that actually led to an outcome uh, that was particularly important for women in politics and women in the law. And that is that in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan's camp saw that he had developed a gender gap. Uh, and that is that uh, women were supporting uh, Carter in higher rates than they were supporting um, Ronald Reagan, or at the very least, uh, there was a gap between the rates of women supporting Reagan and men supporting Reagan. And so he announced in the 1980 campaign, Reagan did, that one of his first appointments to the Supreme Court, should he be given that opportunity, would be the first woman Supreme Court justice. And everyone knows who that is, even though in a way she was sort of overtaken by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in recent years. Uh, and because she left the court um, by her own will in retirement in 2006. But Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman Supreme Court justice uh, because of that gender gap that uh, Jen talked about in the 1980 campaign. And at some point, I'm sure in our hour today, we will perhaps uh, circle back to um, we think of women in politics and electoral politics, and Sandra Day O'Connor was an, uh, a, a master at, at electoral politics. She became the first woman majority leader of a state senate in Arizona. But her being on the court wasn't just symbolic. She took an active role in gender equity, as would Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she joined her on the court in 1993. I'll just jump in to say that I think in addition to the ways that Jen and Barbara have talked about the 19th Amendment, that it also has played an important role in this idea of who is a citizen um, and, the, and women's roles in a democracy and a constitutional republic um, as independent thinkers, as change agents, as um, in, independent agents of their own. I mean, there's the the early mythology of women who are going to just vote like their husbands. Um, and we have seen quite obviously the role that women have played both in terms of their participation rates but also the their independent thinking so even the way that we just think about women in general um, in our society has been affected i believe by the 19th amendment i also think it's the 19th amendment um, played an important role um, and an interesting role as we think about both the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement movements, how they played on one another, um, how one um, learned from the other, um, and also the role that Black women, African American women, um, have played um, kind of sitting, straddling both of those movements, um, not fully benefiting from the 19th Amendment until the 1965 Voting Rights Act was, was passed, um, and what's, what that has meant uh, in terms of the women's movement writ large, um, and again, this idea of citizenship in the United States. Well, we sometimes hear about the concept of women's issues. Yeah, is that a useful way to describe what animates women as citizens and voters? 
<laughs> I, I, I think that's such a, an interesting question. Um, I think that it's easy, but I don't necessarily think that it's meaningful or useful. Um, and in fact, I, I often think that it tends to marginalize uh, issues and marginal, potentially can marginalize women um, and mischaracterize and limit um, the way that we think about those issues. Um, often in having worked in Congress for a number of years, having been the staff person at different points who handled women's issues, um, I certainly understand how that terminology gets used and the basket of issues that often get moved into under that moniker, you know, childcare, women's reproductive health issues, et cetera. But the reality is that when you look at the issues that women care about, they are the issues that people care about. Um, and often at the top of that list were issues of healthcare, issues of jobs and the economy. It may, there may be shadings on those issues, um, but by pushing women's issues into a particular care, uh, category, it seems to indicate that women only care about certain things and that men don't also care about those things. Um, and it also would indicate that women aren't full participants in debates about the larger issues that affect the entire economy, that affect the entire society. So I think that it, it is easy, but often as is the case when things are, are easy, it isn't necessarily fully useful. I, I agree with Melody uh, from the perspective of voters, and it's also not a particularly useful phrasing when it comes to candidates. For a long time, there was this general mythology out there that, well, male candidates were going to be better and more credible and more competent when it came to legislating about things like crime or immigration or the economy. And women would have an edge when it came to issues like abortion and other reproductive rights or child care, pay equity. And it turns out that we're so polarized right now as a society that neither male nor female candidates have an advantage on any of those issues. It all comes down to party. And it doesn't matter if you are a male or a female Republican. There are certain issues where Republicans are traditionally seen as stronger, and that's still the case. And the same thing is true on the Democratic side of the aisle. And in fact, my analyses with Danny Hayes of what it is that candidates campaign on when they run for Congress finds no gender differences whatsoever. Male and female candidates are equally likely to give attention to and be deemed credible by voters on issues like the economy, immigration, war, and reproductive rights. Really all that matters is whether they share a voter's partisanship. Um, just thinking about picking up on some of those differences then, uh, women voters are clearly not a monolithic group. Um, so what do you make, for example, of the uh, activism of African-American women in recent elections? Uh, or what do you see as the different priorities and activities of Republican women and Democratic women? Well, when I think about, particularly after the Doug Jones race in Alabama in 2018, you know, there were the headlines of, you know, African American women are voting, you know, African American women, you know, from the Democratic perspective, African American women have saved Alabama. And I would say, <laughs> go back in history and take a good long hard look um, because African-American women have, and their activism have been a part of our society for quite literally hundreds of years. I mean, Phyllis Wheatley as a slave wrote President George Washington and he wrote her back. Um, and you look at issues like that, you look at women as in the abolitionist movement, obviously in the suffrage movement, um, Ida B. Wells and the anti-lynching campaign, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a first as a woman, as an African-American in many regards, in terms of her seating at a national party uh, convention. So the activism has always been there. Often is the case that the activism and the law haven't, it took a while for them to catch up with one another. So that the barriers for African-American women's participation um, dropped. So again, not only the 19th Amendment, but also passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So the activism, uh, the Black Women's Club movement, um, women's participation in American society has consistently been there, um, but we now are seeing their, the voting rates. And I think as, as uh, Jen was saying earlier, 
women are outpacing men in terms of voter participation. And that is something that's also reflected in the African American community, as well as the, the Latino, the Hispanic community, um, and other communities of color. So um, I think we are seeing women fulfilling the promise of the 19th Amendment of the Voting Rights Act in terms of their participation, but their voter participation now is able to catch up with, with their activism. Uh, and on party differences, Jen, did you want to weigh in or Barbara? I mean, as far as party differences are concerned, Republican women vote a lot like Republican men. So, you know, this general sense that, oh, 2020 is going to be the year that these Republican women all cross party lines, there might be a sliver of them who stay home. They're not going to cross party lines. And this has generally been the case. Partisanship now is an identity that's stronger than all of these other identities, but that's not really that new. And so, you know, when we think about not, when we think about women and female voters as a monolith or not, I think the most important thing that we can do is look within each of the parties for differences because across parties, you really can basically claim that there are two general agendas and two general groups of preferences and goals. Once we look within, I think exactly what Melody is talking about is right, although most of that variation is within the Democratic Party. Craig, I'll toss in a, another historical reference, uh, and that is that, um, as um, Althea mentioned, one of my areas of study is first ladies. And so while we talk about women in politics, and we usually think, again, of, of women in electoral politics, uh, obviously candidate spouses uh, can make a difference in campaigns, and they can make a difference uh, once thus far uh, their husbands uh, are in office. And so I've been working on a project of the political relationship between uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Jack Kennedy as the 1960 camp campaign came on and he had to try to woo her over into his camp. But I think of her back in the 1920s in um, women's politics uh, and becoming head of the women's division or working with the women's division um, in New York state and then working with it in the national party. And it's, it's almost odd, and I maybe Jen knows the answer to this question, that I don't think there's still a women's division of the Democratic Party, but um, you know, women were so segregated at that point that the party, I guess, thought they had to have a women's division that would deal with women's issues. And certainly Eleanor Roosevelt was doing that, and particularly in the 20s with the labor movement she worked with. Um, her view, and this then became quite controversial in the women's movement, was that women needed protective legislation. And that was the progressive view because they were, they and children before there were laws against child labor, uh, women and children in, in, in labor and their abuse and misuse by management. Uh, think of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911, for example, in New York. Um, so Eleanor Roosevelt and those who worked with her in labor and in the women's movement, but even progressives like Louis Brandeis, the late labor lawyer, before he went on the Supreme Court, uh, talked about how because women were different biologically, they needed protective legislation. And well, it's a truism that women are different biologically from men, and it was a truism at the time that they did need protection because they were being abused uh, by management, as were children, and as were men, for that matter. Um, so the rise of the labor movement, thank goodness, helps that. The rise of women in the labor movement helps that, and protective legislation comes on the scene. But that means that Eleanor Roosevelt, as the women's movement grew and changed into the 1940s, the 1950s, certainly the 1960s before she died in 1962. She was being criticized by women uh, who wanted men and women to be treated equally. And that's actually represented by the Sandra Day O'Connors and the Ruth Bader Ginsburg as the, the next generation after uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and then by Hillary Clinton so that she makes her famous statement at the UN Conference on Women in Beijing in the 1990s as First Lady internationally she makes the famous statement that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Yeah thanks uh, so much so much to get into uh, and I also want to make sure we get our audience questions in um, so do continue to offer those in the chat box uh, if you'd like. Uh, here's one that asks why do we have so few women in the House and Senate, as well as throughout our political institutions? Well, that's, this is what I spend my life doing. Uh, <laughs> it's because, shockingly, uh, we don't have that many female candidates. So a lot of people believe that part of the reason we have so few women in Congress and as governors and as mayors and as state legislators is because there's 
an unwillingness on the part of voters to elect women. And that's simply not true. For decades now, when women run for office, they perform as well as men. They're not only as likely to win their races, but they win by comparable margins. Evidence suggests that this is the case in both primaries and general elections on both sides of the aisle. Moreover, they raise just as much money as men, again, in primaries and general elections on both sides of the aisle. And at least at the congressional level, and this is probably gonna surprise a lot of people, systematic studies indicate that there's really no difference in terms of the volume or content of media coverage that female candidates and male candidates receive. So the big issue here is not a demand problem. It's not that voters and donors are unwilling to support female candidates. It's that the perception that they're unwilling to be supported winds up leading women to rationally conclude that they would have to be twice as good to get half as far. And as a result, they're far less likely than men to enter the electoral process in the first place. And in fact, the studies that I've done over the course of the last 20 years have demonstrated that women and men, even when they are well-matched professionally, economically, politically, and educationally, are not equally likely to throw their hats in the ring. They're not even equally likely to consider it. And that's because women are less likely than men to be encouraged to run for office, to be officially recruited to run for office, or to think that they're qualified to run for office. So the real challenge, and I should note that this has been the case over the course of the last 20 years, and it's especially true even among younger women. When we've done national surveys on college campuses, we find that the gender gap in interest in running for office is just as big as it is among 55 and 65 and 70 year olds. So the key here is to focus on the supply side, I would argue, and to encourage more women to get involved in the political process, to encourage more women to run for office, and to debunk these myths that they are unable to succeed when they do enter the ring. Because once we can up that supply, the demand is there. And then to carry it forward, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the difference that women make when they're in elected office. Uh, do they bring greater civility than men? I think there's been some hope along those lines, uh, communicate differently than men or advance different policy priorities? Well, anecdotally, sure, but systematically, uh-uh. Um, so this is the, <laughs> my, my whole life is basically spent just telling people that, no, you're wrong. Um, so, so basically what we, Sean Theriault, who's a professor at the University of Texas and I have done um, quite a bit of analysis on this question. And it turns out that once you take into account partisanship, there really are no differences. Women and men are equally likely to be party loyalists. And what that means is that they're going to be unlikely to cross party lines. They're going to be unlikely to, just because they like people on the other side of the aisle, vote with them. The one piece of information that we found, the one finding that was sort of positive, was that they do seem to genuinely value uh, cross-party relationships. Not so much that those relationships translate into co-sponsoring legislation or voting across party lines on a bill or working together to achieve a compromise, but certainly in terms of making sure that or prioritizing a broad sense of civility in the workplace. And so that's a positive thing. But you know, if we're looking to women to sort of get rid of partisan polarization, to stop the gridlock, to change the way that Congress works. It's just not gonna happen. There are incentives for them to be just as partisan and just as party loyal as men. Can I just um, jump in? And I also wanted to ask Jen a question, because it, stri it strikes me looking at the current elect um, set of uh, races that Susan Collins might be a very good example of this. I mean, from my days working in Congress, I know that you know, the relationships existed across the line. There seems to be an out, a, a consistent expectation that she was going to cross the line. And she, she's a Republican from Maine. I mean, she was a party loyalist in the same way that men are often party loyalists. And I'm curious, Jen, if you see that as an example, but I'm also curious um, because I was smiling as you were answering the question and had heard you talk about this before. And even after you put it out there, do people believe, is, is it just, do people absorb what you're saying or is there such resistance to this idea um, that women aren't going to, that women will cross lines, that women um, aren't going to win, that women can't raise the same kind of money that men can raise? Oh, no one believes me. Um, but what's really interesting, so I would say two things. The first is I actually moderated a conversation with Susan Collins. And so the question was, do you, you know, you often say that you cross party lines, like 
tell us more about that. And really the examples that she gave were that she's civil and she eats lunch with people across the aisle and occasionally there's bipartisan support, but the times that she crosses party lines, she's rarely pivotal, right? So it's unfair, I think, to say that women are more likely to engage in bipartisan legislating when it turns out that there are often bills where men wind up contributing to that bipartisanship too. So she didn't believe me. Um, she didn't believe me even though I was, I, I said, look, I have the data, she didn't care. Um, as far as women not winning elections is concerned, you know, what's tricky here is that everybody knows a woman who has lost an election and everybody knows of a woman who had a hard time raising money in a campaign. And everybody can think of very, very sexist media coverage that Hillary Clinton or some other candidate has gotten. So when you try to explain to somebody that anecdotally these things happen, but systematically there's very little evidence that this has led to a political environment that serves to the detriment of women, people have a hard time reconciling what they've seen with everything that they haven't seen. And so, you know, part of this, I think, comes down to the media. And I will say that over the course of the last even two or three election cycles, the media have done a much better job putting into context broader examples of sexism and discrimination. So they are more likely now, especially the print media, to say, here's an example where a female candidate was treated really, really poorly. This is not the norm. And this is why this is newsworthy. And even 10 years ago, that was not the case. But it's hard to, to convince people when everybody is aware of you know, sporadic sexism and also that they experience sexism and discrimination in their everyday lives. And given that everybody thinks that politics is so much meaner and so much worse than life in general, it's hard to reconcile that with the fact that, well, there's no overt systematic endemic bias. Craig, could, could I uh, jump in and, um, and, and ask in, in light of this part of the conversation, um, again, anecdotally, but thinking about how, it, Jennifer's point about how women candidates or potential candidates or women in college think about running for office and, and the, the binds that, that tie them that they put on themselves. So I'm thinking about Hillary Clinton in the debates in, in, with Donald Trump in 2016, and particularly that moment where Donald Trump loomed behind her. And that uh, I think she says in her memoir that, that she, I don't, I don't remember she directly relates it to gender, but I remember people saying that it was related to gender that, oh, you know, she couldn't, she said she wanted to turn or she wished in retrospect she had turned and said, hey, you creep, get out of my space. But I also think of Melody as well and, and President Obama that, again, there was this anecdote or story about candidate Obama and President Obama not wanting ever to appear angry for falling into a stereotype of angry black men. Um, so is that, do you find, Jen, in your studies that, that that has a role to play? And then Melody, because you were working with President Obama, does, does that have any truth to it? Yes, and so I'd say two things. The first is that presidential elections are still far different than everything else. And the focus of my work has been on congressional elections. Presidential elections are different because we still haven't had a woman elected president. And so it's still very, very novel. And when sex or gender is a novelty, we're not fully aware of how to navigate it. And we're not really sure what the rules are. The second thing I would note though, is that the one area where in the, over the course of my research, we did uncover gender differences had to do with debate performances. And so we interviewed about 50 campaign managers who had worked in races that had women running against men in either 2010 or 2014. And all of them agreed that sex was generally irrelevant on the campaign trail. It was irrelevant in terms of their issue agendas. It was irrelevant in terms of fundraising strategy. Almost all of them said that it was relevant when it came down to the debates, because that's one of the rare times that you see both candidates side by side in person. And the challenge is for a woman to look like she's capable of being bullied. She needs to look really strong, but a man has to demonstrate that he's not a bully. So there are these competing considerations where a man needs to treat her uh, a little bit differently maybe than he would a male candidate, but a woman needs to fight back as though she's been bullied because she wants to come across as strong. And that becomes very, very tricky. And the example that all of the uh, campaign managers of the male candidates gave was the famous Hillary Clinton Rick Lazio debate in 2000 where they were running for the Senate and he approached her on the debate stage uh, and held up a document. He wanted her to sign a document about public financing or saying that she wouldn't take money from groups 
Um, and he walked over and invaded her space and he was literally shaking it in front of her face. And across the board, and this is 2014, so this is 14 years later, they're like, we have to avoid a Rick Lazio moment. And so there's this general sense that there are certain things that you don't do. And implied in that was the general sense that, well, if Hillary Clinton had been a male candidate, Rick Lazio walking across the stage and shaking something in his face wouldn't have probably ended the election that night. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Are we likely to see any of this play out in the vice presidential debates uh, the coming week? I, I can't imagine that Mike Pence is gonna get in Kamala Harris's face. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 would, I would agree. Um, I think that one will be probably be a more straight down the middle, hard, hard fought in terms of the debate, um, but uh, less, less fraught in many other ways kind of debate. So it'll be interesting, won't it, for Kamala Harris, because, well, it, it seems to me that um, Mike Pence is, is the kind of the ultimate gentleman candidate. He's soft-spoken and um, certainly has strong views, but he doesn't seem to have a bullying nature. Uh, so I, I suspect he'll stick to that uh, and also want to contrast himself with the blowback against the president and his behavior in the first presidential debate this year. But it will be interesting for Kamala Harris, given that she was not afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, Vice President Biden on the primary candidate stage uh, debates uh, and uh, see how, how she responds to the first presidential debate from this year, but also sort of carry out the persona that she demonstrated as a strong woman, as a strong person, as a strong candidate, uh, it particularly on the busing challenge uh, to Vice President Biden that everyone remembers. Uh, and I, I do remember people saying about her who were opposed to her that they thought that that was, um, that was disrespectful, they said. Yeah, yeah, I think that she will absolutely use because they are part of who she is, her prosecutorial skills and her debate uh, questioning skills. Uh, I think that what will be interesting will be to watch uh, how on an even larger stage that's absorbed. And this issue, I think uh, both of you were referring to of, uh, is, does she seem angry? Um, does she seem too harsh? You know, just kind of what perceptions may exist. Um, and I think that she's demonstrated that she's going to be, she's going to be who she is. Um, and she is a seasoned lawyer and prosecutor and she's going to, to use those skills on, on the stage. Another audience question coming in. Uh, in what ways did the Trump presidency affect the role and perception of women in politics? Do you believe that Trump's election incentivized more women to run and become politically active? So empirically, it did incentivize more women to run. However, it also incentivized more men to run. So what we've seen in the post-Trump era is a lot of energy on the part of Democrats, so much so that we've had a record number of male and female Democratic candidates in the last two election cycles. Um, that's generally good news for democracy. It's not that great in terms of women's representation because most of these candidates and most of the competition is happening in primaries. And so even though we've seen an uptick in the percentage of women serving in Congress and will likely continue to, it nowhere nears the uptick in the numbers of women candidates just because they're competing against one another now in many cases uh, and in competitive races. The other thing that I'll note is that Donald Trump does not seem to have spurred Republican women on the same way that he has Democrats. In 2018, the Republicans actually saw a net decline in the percentage of women serving in Congress. This time around, they too have a record number of candidates, but it's nowhere near the number that the Democrats are fielding. So it seems like the way that he's affected women in politics is to further <laughs> women who are opposed to him, as opposed to encourage women who support him also to get into the ring. I also think it's interesting. I was looking at a statistic I think from, from Jen's former institution at AU, the Women in Politics Institute, that said that 40% of millennial women and women of color, um, which is about 30 or so percent of women, said that they were more involved this year than in previous years. I mean, just to, to continue to underscore what, what Jen was saying. 
Um, to expand this a bit to the uh, judicial branch, uh, we've recently been celebrating the life and legacy of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and are closely watching the emerging debate around the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. How would you describe the role and impact of women in the judicial branch? Uh, and I, I think I'll throw that one to Barbara first. Well, the, so thank you. And the Supreme Court is, is my area. And so I, I don't have the kinds of data that, that Jen has about Congress. Uh, for the lower federal judiciary, other than to say uh, that it was like the Supreme Court for most of our history, uh, a, a white male Protestant dominated uh, institution, and that um, Jimmy Carter actually started an affirmative action program for the, the lower federal judiciary. He was one of uh, only four presidents who never got to appoint a member of the Supreme Court. In fact, the only uh, president to serve a full term and only one term without uh, a nominee to the Supreme Court. But he did make an impact uh, through this affirmative action program uh, for the lower federal judiciary, uh, the courts of appeals and the district courts. Uh, and, in, and in fact, it was Jimmy Carter who named Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the DC Circuit, the DC Court of Appeals, which is a bit of a proving ground uh, for moving up to the US Supreme Court. And so she served there for uh, 13 years before President Clinton named her to the US Supreme Court in 1993. And one of the ways that Jimmy Carter um, approached this was to put together commissions, um, diverse commissions and panels uh, who would recommend to him the names of more diverse candidates for the lower federal judiciary. And uh, Melody participated uh, as the, the chief counsel for the uh, Judiciary Committee with Senator Kennedy, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, on judicial appointments. So she may want to jump in on this as well. But I should also say that uh, President Bush 43 had a, um, a strong record of diversity uh, on the lower federal benches, uh, particularly uh, for Hispanic uh, nominees. Um, for the Supreme Court, I think everybody knows that um, uh, we're way behind the curve on having women uh, represented. One time Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked, how many women do you think should be on the Supreme Court? And she said, well, nine. <laughs> so, you know, someday, perhaps there'll be nine women on the Supreme Court and no one will comment upon that, just as no one noted for most of its history that there were nine males until 1980 and 81. Uh, but I would say, for as I did for both uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and Justice O'Connor, uh, that they had, they fought for gender equity. I think it's important to note, not simply, though it would have been important for uh, women's rights and, and women's equality, but uh, particularly Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her leading of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project uh, brought six cases to the Supreme Court, one all but one of them, and several of them were really important cases for gender equity for men uh, who had been treated um, unfairly and unequally by federal laws. Uh, so I think it's important to note that. Uh, and now we have um, two members of the court uh, appointed by President Obama, um, Justice Sotomayor, uh, obviously, and Justice Kagan, uh, who remain and may be joined by Amy Coney Barrett. And this will be kind of back to Jen's point uh, that uh, women who come from one side of the aisle or the other uh, will have their own views that will actually match those of their party. And that is true in some ways with Sotomayor and Kagan. And obviously Amy Coney Barrett, if she sticks to uh, her record on the Seventh Circuit where she's been for three years and her prolific writing uh, in law review articles and speeches to the Federalist Society has made it pretty clear where she stands, uh, particularly on the abortion issue, for example. Um, so it, it just because she's a woman doesn't mean that she will be in favor of reproductive rights in the abortion realm or, or in birth control cases. And that's somewhat similar to, uh, there was a Catholic seat on the court, for example, that started back in the late 1800s as Catholics and Jews came to this country in vast waves of immigration. A Jewish seat developed with Justice Brandeis being placed there by Woodrow Wilson in 1916. And as I say, a Catholic seat in the late 1890s that really survived through most of the 20th century. But eventually three Catholics ended up on the court at the same time. Justice Brennan, who was a liberal, uh, Justice Scalia, who was a conservative, and Justice Kennedy, who was a moderate and a swing vote. And that's probably what we'll see with women, at least on the Supreme Court and maybe throughout the federal judiciary. Um, it, just a, a couple of things to add to what Barbara was saying. One of the interesting things, and this goes to the you know, women who have uh, different judicial philosophies, um, but how they both, in my opinion, advanced uh, women's issues of equity for women. Um, when Justice Ginsburg uh, 
announced the VMI decision, um, there was this uh, observed back and forth between her and Justice O'Connor um, because of the work that they would both done on issues um, over time that ultimately led to Justice Ginsburg's uh, opinion. Um, so some of the work that Justice O'Connor had done um, and the precedent there um, that was also uh, contributed to or built upon by Justice Ginsburg and, and so forth. So it, it's, there was an interesting conversation between the justices, and I don't, I don't mean, I'm sure they did discuss it, but I don't mean that literally, but conversation around these issues. On the issue just of women, the numbers of women on the court, and Barbara was talking about President Carter and the commissions, in the, the way that judges were used to get to the lower courts and, well, the lower courts in particular, allowed for a, a, almost a Rolodex-like treatment of it, meaning, you know, who, so who's in my Rolodex? And often, depending on who you are, that depend, that then shapes who's in your Rolodex. Um, and ultimately, the efforts that were made to diversify the courts, both in terms of gender and in terms of race, and deal with issues like, um, and I won't belabor it, but the, the blue slip process, would, which would allow senators to place holds on on nominees or prevent them from going forward, um, the hold process, um, the ways that nominees came um, to the district court and the court of appeals, um, all of those things have been loosened uh, in considerable ways so that in an effort to make sure that qualified candidates, uh, regardless of race and gender, and in an effort to create diversity, are able to make it to those courts. I just to back up uh, Melody's point about Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg uh, in the VMI case with uh, ultimately Justice Ginsburg writing the opinion uh, to allow women to be uh, admitted to the, the state Virginia Military Institute and the Citadel, two military institutes uh, that are state run and uh, banned women from admission. One of the first opinions in, in the early part of Justice O'Connor's uh, history on the court uh, was a, a ban from the University um, of Mississippi for women that banned men and particularly from the nursing program and a, a male who wanted to be a nurse and was lived very near that university brought his case all the way to the Supreme Court and Justice O'Connor leading the court writing the opinion that said the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does not allow a state to ban men uh, from a university or from a special program such as nursing. Uh, and then I would also say that that then that kind of view I think that she had uh, and this moderate conservatism that she had but also uh, finding the middle ground of, I believe, where most Americans are. Uh, she found that on the court as a swing vote. She also could write then in affirmative action cases, particularly the University of Michigan Law School case, uh, that she believed in affirmative action for underrepresented uh, student classes such as African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans who were very underrepresented at the University of Michigan Law School. She did say she hoped that some 50 years after that, that uh, affirmative action would no longer be necessary. But I think her, the very fact that she, in a way, was the product of affirmative action on the Supreme Court made her very open-minded about that. I'd also note that Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that in writing the opinion in the VMI case, it was Justice Scalia's dissent that actually strengthened her arguments. And so if Amy Coney Barrett is, in fact, confirmed, and at this point, it's hard to imagine that she won't be, um, maybe that'll be the indirect way that she ultimately helps the liberal side of the court push uh, women's rights and equity. Um, because as a Scalia uh, clerk, you know, she clearly shares his judicial philosophy. Um, and everybody's probably read about that amazing friendship um, between uh, strange bedfellows <laughs> of Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia, and they were sitting on a stage together. And I think it was that opinion, Jen, they were talking about that I think that was the one that Justice Ginsburg said that Justice Scalia sent her an early draft of his dissent. He was the sole dissenter in the VMI case. And that she said, she sort of looked at him across the stage and said, yes, and it made my opinion stronger because I could uh, respond to his concerns and his dissent. Another audience question is pointing us towards the future. Uh, for as far as women have gone so far in politics, in an ideal world, where should we be? What do you want to see happen in the next five to 10 years and what's possible? 
oh, five to 10 years is not a long enough timeline. Um, I, and I, I say that just because if you think about the incumbency advantage, even in election cycles where everybody wants to vote the bums out, incumbents are still reelected more than 90% of the time. Heading into elections where congressional approval is literally in the single digits and 49% of Americans say that we'd be better off replacing every single member of Congress, including their own with a random person walking down the street, 94% of incumbents still get reelected. So given that men are still 75% of the members of the House of, uh, of the Senate and you know, even more in the House of Representatives, and that nine out of 10 of them seek re-election and that more than nine out of 10 of those then win re-election. There just aren't enough opportunities for women to make substantial gains in the next one or two election cycles. 20 years out, we could potentially see something like 40% women in Congress, but we've just got to think about the electoral opportunities and what the institutional rules look like. It's not a situation where we can just say, oh, if all of these women run for office, they're gonna get elected they will taking into account the kinds of districts in which they're running. But the reality is that incumbents are often their competitors and in almost all cases they win. And, and I look forward to that point in time, 20 years down the road <laughs> that Jen was, was talking about, um, mixed with a little bit of, of Justice Ginsburg. I mean, I, I would hope that the door would be flung open and the sky would be the limit and I, I remember being a staff person in the Senate and in the Senate, there are all kinds of rules, including when staff can literally go on the floor of the Senate. You have to be invited to, to the floor, but there's a staff bench that's on the perimeter of the room. And I remember sitting there sometimes and just looking around and thinking, do people think this looks normal? <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the lack of, of diversity and, and diversity is important not just for diversity's sake, but diversity is important because of the different perspectives that are brought, brought and experiences that are brought to the table that make the outcomes and the decisions better and stronger. I mean, we see that when in business, I mean, that's being reflected. We're seeing all kinds of studies that prove that. And the same thing exists um, and our politics would benefit from the same thing. I'll use the university as an example uh, of progress in this area. Most of you or many of you are probably alums of the university. And uh, just a couple of issues ago with the alumni magazine, uh, probably saw it was devoted to uh, when the university opened up, particularly the undergraduate um, College of Arts and Sciences to women. And one statistic that really caught my eye, and they had a wonderful timeline uh, in the magazine, uh, but the one statistic that caught my eye because uh, I came to the university for graduate school to do my PhD in 1981, and it had a statistic from 1980 that uh, the professorship uh, in, in 1980, I think 14% of UVA professors were women. And in the then called government departments, now called the politics department, which by the way, Jen leads. Jennifer Lawless is the new chair of the politics department. Yay, Jen. Um, there were, I would say maybe there were 60 professors when I came in in 1981. Uh, there were three women. One was an adjunct who would come once a week from James Madison to teach public administration. And then there were two sort of slots that seemed to be saved for women. And they would bring in new PhDs, women who would then either be let go after three years and their contracts would not be renewed. So they couldn't even get up to be considered for tenure or they'd get to the six year mark to be considered for tenure and then they would be denied tenure. And then at the very end of my five to six years and getting my PhD, um, the department to its credit did bring in a chaired professor, uh, Martha Durthick from uh, Brookings, I think in Harvard, uh, who was an expert on public policy, uh, particularly and federalism. Um, so the times were changing slowly, but I also want to give a shout out to my mentor, Henry Abraham, who um, a, a gentleman to be sure from the old country was a Holocaust survivor and he just passed away at 98 in February. But Henry did not see color or gender or gender preference or religion. He had graduate students and undergraduates he mentored uh, from all walks of life, from all parts of the country. Uh, and it didn't matter whether he was a man or a woman, um, he was going to mentor us uh, to the best of his ability, which was fantastic. I, I will say, because I'm the dark cloud in every room, that uh, the politics department today has 37 tenure-lined faculty members. 
and only 27% are women. So we're basically making progress at the same rate as the United States Congress, which is progress and it's something and it's incremental, but it's important to keep in mind that the amount of work that still needs to be done is pretty substantial. So as we come to our, our last few questions here, what advice would you offer young women who are thinking about how best to become involved in politics uh, today, either informally in an activist role or formally uh, running for office, uh, either in Virginia or elsewhere? Well, I think Jen's research says a lot. Um, and the, starting with do it. <laughs> you know, if you, if you are interested, if this is your passion, if this is something that you care about, then do it. Um, and some of the things that may be holding you back are actually myths. And uh, so I think that's, that's one thing. I also think that it's important, you know, to consider the many, many, many ways that you can become engaged from being a candidate, um, obviously, obviously being a voter, um, but whether it's uh, uh, policy advocacy through an NGO, um, direct service. There are a lot of different ways to become engaged in policy and, and, and policy making in politics. So consider that versus your uh, in lined with your interests and your abilities. And then the other thing I think about when I look at my career, I think about the really wonderful, not only mentors, but sponsors that I've had and people who have been highly supportive of my career, helped to advance my career, and there have been some really, really wonderful women, and there's been some really, really wonderful men. I mean, Barbara and I were on a panel earlier today with John Podesta, who has, you know, just was an incredible um, sponsor. Um, Senator Kennedy, I could go through a list. So think about that also as um, an equal opportunity field um, in terms of those who can be helpful and, and guiding and supportive. Well, and Melody's the perfect example, though I always support her as our first woman president, and I hope she'll, she'll run one day for that position. <laughs> no, did she say no? Oh, but, but she's the perfect example of not having to run for office, but to have uh, impact and influence at the highest levels on Capitol Hill and uh, in the White House. Uh, I will say, uh, when I was 16, I know this will be hard for people to believe, especially those who know, but I was in a fashion show. It was just a little department store in Louisville, but I was in a fashion show, and they had asked us to put down our career aspirations, and so as I walked out onto the runway, um, they said, and this is Barbara Perry, and she's 16, and she wants to be the first woman president of the United States, and this was in the 1970s, and there was gasping from the audience and twitters and uh, guffaws and, and some applause. I think that, that was my parents. But um, I, so what I did was I just got into campaigns really early. And I worked in campaigns for senators uh, when I was in high school and for board of aldermen when I was in college and senators again when I was in college and then did internships because I wanted to see best I could, you know, what this was like. And so I had internships on Capitol Hill. I had internships at the Justice Department in local government. And it helped me to understand that I actually didn't want to run for office and I didn't want to be an office holder, but I wanted to study it and I wanted to continue to be a part of it as practically as I could through uh, things like my judicial fellowship and in mid-career, there are White House fellows, there are Supreme Court fellows, there are congressional fellows. So even if your career takes a turn that's not running for office, though we hope you will do that. Um, I think there are loads of ways to be involved in government and to study it and spread the word about the importance of our democratic republic and being involved in it. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. In 2006, I actually ran for Congress in Rhode Island's second congressional district in a democratic primary, and I lost. The funny thing is, at the time, the incumbent had served for six years, and our big argument was, he's been there too long. We have to vote him out. <laughs> there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because people say all the time, well, why would you want to do that? And I think that we tend to spend all of our time thinking about everything that Washington is incapable of doing and everything that DC gridlock represents. And we don't tend to realize that even when Congress isn't effective, they're still sending social security checks to hundreds of thousands of people. They're still making sure that we have roads and that we have, uh, air control and that we have, you know, the ability and an infrastructure to get things done. They're still, they're, they're not taking into account the fact that there are really, really hardworking people on both sides of the aisle, not only in Washington, 
but we have 500,000 elected offices across this country. And there are local and state level elected officials making sure that you're safe and that your life is able, I mean, this isn't the best time given COVID, but like generally speaking, their goal is to make sure that the country runs and is operational. And what I always say to people is that most of those offices are completely below the radar screen. And so if you don't want to raise a million dollars and if you don't want to spend 35, 35 hours a week asking people you've never met for more money than they can possibly give. And if you don't want your face plastered all over billboards, there are still about 499,000 options for you. And so it's important to look at the local level where a lot of these races are uncontested and a lot of activity is just really about convincing a couple hundred people that you do a really good job. And I just want to end with one quick anecdote, which is we all talk about negative campaigns and how it's awful and how you need thick enough skin to get involved in politics. And what I can tell you is that one of the best days of running for Congress was when I was sitting in the basement of my campaign office and I was making fundraising phone calls and we had a TV and I looked up on the screen and my face was all distorted on the screen. And my opponent came on and he said, Jennifer Lawless distorts the truth. And it was so amazing and so exciting because he was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to convince Rhode Islanders that I was a liar which meant that he was really worried about this race. And any concern that I might have had about being accused of lying or being you know, dragged through the mud immediately disappeared because I knew how much I wanted to win and I knew how good I knew I would be in Congress that this just validated that. So it's important to realize too that the person you are as a candidate isn't necessarily the person you expect you'll be. I, I would suggest that at some point after a long tenure here that Jen run again, <laughs> we'll, we'll be with you because I, I think that was beautifully put and expressed and kind of the heart of a public servant. And I will just say, while I don't want to run for president, but thank you, Barbara, <laughs> um, being a public servant uh, is, I would not trade a second of it. It is an honor and it is a privilege. Um, the people who do it, the vast, 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 vast majority of them do it for absolutely the right reasons. Uh, and it is a way to give to our constitutional republic. Uh, one of the ways that you can give to our constitutional republic, it is well worth with doing for all the reasons that Jen said. And, and I also want to be open-minded, be open-minded. In other words, if you're not running with a, a label of Republican or Democrat, but you're, you're taking a more academic route, let's say, um, I, I have done things that, that people would say, I can't believe you wrote speeches for William Rehnquist, or I can't believe you know Mitch McConnell, or you're going to do George, you know, George W. Bush's, uh, you're going to do his oral history, or you're going to do the Obama oral, you know, depending on where my friends are on the spectrum. But by being open-minded as a scholar, um, I, yes, I have my own politics, my own partisanship, but it can give you experiences like you've never had before and really open your mind to the beauties of our system. You've all done tremendous service and uh, that includes today. So uh, on behalf of all of our audience, uh, I wanna thank you for that uh, and throw it back to Althea. Oh my goodness, I'm applauding for you. <laughs> that was fantastic. I think the audience is also applauding. You can't hear them. But uh, thank you all, Barbara, Melanie, Jennifer and Craig. What a great informative conversation. Thanks for sharing with us today. And thanks for taking time away from your busy, busy schedule. Uh, Barbara came on saying that, uh, you know, she's getting called from the press right now, uh, asking for her opinion on, on what's happening in the news right now. So the, this, this, this panel is incredibly busy and we thank you for spending uh, a, an, an hour with us uh, for the More Than Score program.